Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome back to another edition. I uh, recently got a survey that kind of caught my attention. So I got to looking at it this morning and doing some research. And while I, I've written about this, I think once in 20 or 25 years, I've really never devoted a, a lot of time on it and especially exploring the emotional side. So what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about our money scripts on final expenses, our money scripts on funeral costs, whether we're going to be buried, cremated, or some type of alternative disposal of our remains. Now, of course, getting into this topic is fraught with emotion, right? Of course it is. And it would be really easy for me to venture off into the emotion of death and dying, which is huge, right? It's something we, as a society, avoid, uh, resist, try not talking about. Um, and, and I see this with my clients at one point in time. I thought, you know, it's almost negligent of me as a financial planner to not be addressing or helping clients with their actual memorial or funeral plans. What do you want in the way of a funeral? Uh, where would it be? Who would be involved in it? I mean, just all the details. And I started doing a lot of research into plans. Certainly there's something out there, you know, that I could incorporate very easily into our estate planning uh, module. <laughs> and after a little while, I gave up because there wasn't anything, quote, out there. There was nothing that was kind of cookie cutter. Uh, it was a, a huge topic and one that I found that clients did not care about or embrace much the way that I found that clients didn't really care about ethical wills. And I think I've said that before on the podcast, how I went to a training in basically writing a last letter to your heirs on what was important in your life and what you hoped that they would take away or, or no. It's like, what would you most want to say to your heirs? Sounds like a great idea, but um, I'm trying to think if I've ever had a client initiate one because it is so emotionally impactful. And I, I did one myself um, and it was hugely impactful uh, and, and very emotional and brought up lots of uh, sadness or remorse or fear, things that uh, we just don't go running toward to embrace. Lots of, in IFS speak, exiles, right? So I'm not going to get into all the emotions of dying. I'd, I'd like to kind of keep this balanced on the financial side of dying. But um, we make up a lot of, a lot of money scripts around this. And there's a guy that's worth looking up. His name is Josh Slocum. He's executive director of the Funeral Consumers Alliance and co-author of a book called Final Rights, Reclaiming the American Way of Death. And he's done a lot of interviews over the last 10 years, and I have quoted him once before, and I found a 
interview he gave in uh, June of 2018, where he said, we are led to believe that we might not care as much about our parents unless we have X, Y, Z. But all of these are made up stories. X, Y, and Z meaning this type of funeral or this type of burial, etc. But we have all these made up stories, which he doesn't know what we call those, but those are money scripts. All these made up stories that we allow ourselves to be told. And the only people who benefit are the storytellers, i.e. the funeral homes. So he's uh, quite a critic of the U.S. funeral industry and what it's become. And his comments are uh, worth noting. Uh, I don't know if I finished uh, this June 2018 interview. It's in digital-dying.com. Well worth uh, reading. And in another uh, source that I visited in putting all this together, it said that our beliefs on final expenses, i.e. money scripts, come largely from our family, our culture, and our religion. Well, is there any surprise amongst listeners to this podcast, that family, culture, and religion would influence uh, our money scripts? Of course they would. And about 33% of all of our money scripts in this one survey came from that source. Another interesting stat that I came across was that money scripts on funeral expenses go so deep that 68 Two-thirds of Americans say they would do final expenses differently if money was not a factor. Wow. Now, I'm trying to think of the um, uh, exercises that I helped develop well, what, way back in 2005, to help a person come up with all of the money scripts that they have. I suppose I could take a look very quickly at a book <laughs> and see uh, see if what's in there. But we would list uh, just a whole list of things. So I would say, okay, what do you believe about money and spending, money and religion? Uh, money and spirituality. And actually, this is on page 86 of Facilitating Financial Health. We call it the Money Scripts Brainstorming Exercise. And I see that the fourth one listed on here is money and death. But that's not very specific, right? Um, as I'm looking at this list... I don't see anything on here about money and funeral expenses or money and final expenses, which is kind of interesting because honestly, it's never something I have thought much about. <clears throat> For those of you that think money scripts is a one and done exercise, <laughs> it is not. You know, here I am, not quite 20 years later, still finding out areas of money scripts that I hadn't, haven't even thought about. So this is kind of um, unplowed uh, ground for most of us and, and including myself. So, um, so that was really interesting to me that 68% of Americans would do things differently if money was no factor in burial. Now, I have to say, this is not something that I address in financial planning with clients. Almost a, not at all. Uh, we historically put in about a $10,000 figure for final expenses, which is generally the cost of a traditional funeral. I would say 
it probably comes as no surprise that our average client is of means. You know, our average client, when it comes to financial planning, is, is in the top 3% of all Americans. So it's not surprising this is an area that I don't address much. Uh, I also don't address this area much with my financial therapy clients. Um, now, I would guess, I haven't thought a lot, a lot about this, but you guys are used to me thinking <laughs> on the fly on this podcast, that probably my financial planning clients are older than my financial therapy clients. <clears throat> but I just don't ever remember. You know, and uh, how long have I been doing this? Three years? <clears throat> Two or three years I've been doing uh, IFS, Informed Financial Therapy with folks, of costs for a funeral ever coming up. And yet, 68% of Americans would do something different if money were not a factor. And what would they do differently? They would lean toward more traditional burials, i.e. caskets, and cremation, which are the two most expensive options. And you might be surprised because you might think, almost as I have, what other options are there, right? except maybe having your remains made into a diamond or a ring or something like that. But still, that probably costs more than the average cremation, right? So, uh, if you're still with me in this podcast, I can appreciate that reducing funeral and burial costs probably isn't top on your list to cover on date night with your partner or your financial advisor. Uh, yet it, it is on the minds of two-thirds of Americans. But still, saving for your funeral, saving for the way you're going to be disposed, I just don't think probably has the same excitement as saving for a vacation to the Bahamas or even an IRA. You know, I've joked a lot that, okay, uh, at, you know, Ask the normal brain, what gives you more juice? Saving for a vacation to the Bahamas, you know, the sun, the sand, the sea, the wind, relaxing on a beach, or an IRA, where you get a statement every month. <laughs> so I've, I've kind of downplayed, and it's it's really true to the brain, uh, to, to save... Um, successfully, we've got to have the same juice on saving for the IRA as for the Bahamas. And, and that happens when we can envision what we would do with that IRA in 10, 20, or 30 years. And that maybe we'd be living at the Bahamas, not just visiting. So I digress a little bit there, but it's the same with funeral and burial costs. It's just not exciting. So, it was uh, interesting that um, when I was doing the research on this, that a survey uh, found that 28% of people have changed their burial or funeral plans as a result of the current inflation and financial distress in the economy. And uh, so it's, my point is, it's very much on people's minds. So how are people dealing with um, their final expenses? What are the money scripts around this? Well, the, the most popular way that people plan on dealing with their funeral expenses is to have a funeral insurance or a prepaid funeral plan. That's 39%. Now, this can kind of seem to be a logical way. I mean, we insure for a lot of things. Um, why not insure 
for dying. Well, the, in, in most cases, insurance, whatever, whatever event we're insuring against is not a finality. For example, I sure insure my home against burning down or being blown away. I insure my car against being hit or uh, me being sued. None of those are eventualities. But dying is certain. So if I'm going to insure against a certainty, it might be reasonable to assume that these plans are going to be very expensive because it's going to happen, right? And insurance companies need to make a profit. So this goes into taking a look at these policies and it really means you've got to pay a lot of attention. Now, honestly, I have never looked at a prepaid funeral plan or a, a, a plan bought for funeral expenses that I thought was good. Uh, almost in every case, they either didn't cover what the people thought that they would cover or uh, they they were capped in some way or, or just deficient. And most, you know, I can remember some where the, the rate of, of interest, there, a lot of them are just whole life policies. And you could do better just saving the money in a savings account or investing it in a balanced uh, a mutual fund over a period of time. And there is an article that appeared in AARP.org. Um, I think it first appeared in 2020. It was updated in April of 2023 uh, called Prepaid Funerals, a Grave Error. And again, Slocum that I quoted before was quoted in this article as saying, some prepaid plans can actually cost you more in payments over time than the amount they'll pay out on your funeral. <laughs> okay, which underscores my general thought that you're better off to save for your funeral than buy insurance. And I'm not going to take a deep dive into that. I do have a column that I've written on that. Oh, I'm trying to think the year. I don't know. It might have been some, probably sometime in the last five years. So 39% of people are going to buy insurance that's probably going to cost them more than self-funding the funeral. Well, there sure seems to be some money scripts around that, right? Um, money scripts around insurance and more. So to this end, it might be no surprise to you that the plan that many people have for paying for their funeral expenses is to not have a plan. Not having a plan is a plan. This survey found that 23%, almost one quarter of people say the way they're going to address their final expenses is to let their friends and family figure it out. Wow. Um, and I've written a lot on uh, estate planning. I am sure I've said things about that in, in the podcast. I think it is like 68% of people don't have a will. So they basically kick the can down the road and doing the same thing. Like, well, I'll just let my heirs figure it out. Uh, so it should be no uh, surprise that we have the same attitude when it comes to paying for a funeral. And this is kind of a societal um, way to deal with things, isn't it? I mean, does this sound like the way Congress deals with sticky financial issues? So let's just kick the can down the road. So if this is the plan that your family members or your parents 
are addressing their final expenses, A, you probably don't know it because it's never been discussed. Have you asked your parents, how are you dealing with your final expenses? Maybe that begs a discussion so that you can be prepared, especially if your parents are like 60% of Americans, I just got this stat this morning, that live hand to, hand to mouth, month to month. There is no money set aside for a funeral. 60% of Americans. So what will you do when there's no money in the estate to take care of your parents? Now you can, you can uh, let the, the, uh, the state pay for the, the funeral. And that's probably the most inexpensive way to go, but there won't be a funeral. It's, I think, it's cremation. And probably a very quick cremation. I'm not sure, but there is a plan. Just like uh, if you don't have a will, the state does have a plan on how they are going to get rid of your assets. So the survey followed up on that thought and asked the respondents if they've ever been burdened by the cost of a loved one's funeral expense. And 39% said yes. I mean, that's a significant minority of people that have said, yeah, uh, it's been a financial burden to us um, when a loved one passed and we had to deal with their their funeral expenses. And it's not exclusive to the US. Uh, Yahoo cited a recent study in the UK that reported 43% of adults in that country had actually gone into debt or experienced financial hardship to pay for a funeral. All right, so we've got money scripts. We've got all sorts of money scripts that somehow this may take care of itself. It's not okay to ask parents about their final expenses. Parents that have money scripts of, um, it's, it's okay to let my kids figure this out. And sometimes, you know, when you're asking somebody to write down their money scripts, I think this is one that's not going to appear. Um, very often because we might say, well, I don't have any money scripts around uh, <clears throat> final expenses, or maybe the money script is, this is too, um, you shouldn't talk about death and dying, um, or it's, <clears throat> it's too emotional, or I doubt that a person's going to say, my money script is, let the kids deal with it because it's kind, of a, it's kind of a money script that's underneath all those other money scripts. It's kind of like, well, I guess what you're saying is, this is a burden you want to put on your kids. Well, no, I'm, yeah, well, maybe. Um, so uh, it kind of bears sorting out. In fact, we're looking at doing a uh, third edition of facilitating financial health. And I think that's one I need to add to that list. Okay, so what do Americans choose for the way that they want to be uh, distributed? <laughs> Almost like a 401k. 37% um, choose cremation and 29% choose burial in a casket and of course the traditional burial is is down quite a bit and yet if uh, Americans had more money we know more of them would choose burial, burial in a casket but there's even in a less expensive form of burial plans that have tripled in since just 2020 and that is the natural or green burial. Those uh, people selecting those have risen, risen from four to 11%. And 
And what are we talking about when we're talking about a green or a natural burial? Uh, what we're talking about would be something called a direct burial or cremation where the person is uh, buried or cremated like very quickly, within 24 hours of death. Now, we we know that this is very popular, I think, in Muslim countries. Well, that's a direct burial. And in fact, worldwide, globally, um, embalming is is not that popular. Another uh, alternative burial method is a casket rental where the um, you kind of have a formal viewing as such, but the, the uh, casket is rented and then uh, the remains can be disposed typically either by burial or, or cremation. There's also something popped up called do-it-yourself funerals. Uh, purchasing caskets online, um, having the final viewing at home or where the person dies by um, keeping the person on dry ice. I know that sounds kind of morbid. It all is morbid, right? But there are options. And if you read the um, information from... Uh, uh, the gentleman Josh Slocum that I quoted at the beginning of this, it's fascinating. He's got a lot of interesting things to say about this and about the funeral industry. Um, so you can save money uh, paying attention to this. The Washington Post cited that families can save an average of five to $6,000 by going with the immediate burial, the direct burial, as compared with traditional. Well, when you don't have any money, that's a lot of money. And according to Forbes, direct cremation is the cheapest and most common cremation method in the U.S. And the average cost, okay, here's here's the savings. The average cost of an alternative burial is $2,000 versus $7,000 for cremation and $10,000 for the traditional burial. So I just wanna end with a quote uh, from Slocum. It's a little bit long, but I thought it was very interesting. He said, we humans, we the humans, the adults, the grieving mourners have to make adult choices. I'm sorry to say that most of us don't. The funeral doesn't have to be $8,000. But that's a grown-up choice that we make every day and in every other sphere in our lives. We may not be able to afford a $50,000 destination wedding. So we have a wedding in the local church. There are many ways to grieve a loved one. You don't have to chain yourself to the idea that the only way to have a good funeral is to bankrupt yourself and break your pocketbook. We are not as helpless as Americans. Most of what we try and tell people is they do have control in this. Boy, if that isn't addressing money scripts, I don't know what is. So take a look. Maybe uh, when you get done with this, if you're not driving and in a place you can, write down your money scripts. Now, what do I believe about money and funerals, money and cremation, money and being buried immediately. Um, just all of these. Don't censor yourself and see what comes up. Okay, thanks for joining me. Look forward to uh, speaking with you next week. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.